beautiful. Uh, <laughs> and I will introduce the next speaker, uh, William Waller. Uh, the title is The Case for Coordinating Earth and Space Science Education from Endicott College, USA. Please proceed, William. Greetings, everyone. I'm Bill Hello. Waller coming to you from uh, Rockport, Massachusetts on the seacoast on a warm summer's evening. I will now share my oh. screen and uh, go for it. Oops, there we go. All right. Um, oops. Okay. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is the case for coordinating earth and space science education. And I will be focusing mostly on uh, formal earth and space science education and specifically education in the secondary grades. So this background picture pretty much says it all. Uh, here you have this uh, photo by Alan Dyer of the Waterton Lakes National Park up in Canada. Uh, up, on, up north enough so that you can see an aurora, a beautiful aurora, uh, which is an upper atmospheric phenomenon involving uh, the sun and particles coming from the sun. And then uh, you also see uh, a comet. Co this is Comet Neowise that made its appearance uh, in uh, just a few short weeks ago. And uh, so you, you can see that in this one scene, we've got both earth and space together. And that's basically how we experience space, uh, usually uh, from the perspective of Earth. And Earth can be uh, understood from the perspective of space. So I'm, I'm pitching for the education to be bundled together and that there be coordination in these regards. Okay. However, currently, Earth and space sciences are often taught separately, if ever, uh, unfortunately. Um, the earth sciences involve the study of the earth's geosphere, so that's the rocks and metal core inside. Uh, the hydrosphere, that's all the waters on and in the earth. The cryosphere, the ice that is also on and in the earth. And the atmosphere with all its layers all the way up to the magnetosphere. And then the biosphere, which infiltrates all these other spheres, including uh, the geosphere where we have uh, limestone beds, coal beds, oil beds, etc. All these spheres are interacting and evolving. So that's earth sciences. Space sciences involves the study of earth as a planet among other planets and other bodies in our solar system, other stellar and planetary systems, the Milky Way, our Milky Way galaxy, other galaxies and the large scale cosmos, its structure, origin and evolution. And so you can see already that these are really one integrated subject. And this picture right over here uh, pretty much says it all. Uh, you have uh, the badlands of New Mexico with these amazing hoodoos that have been weathered uh, by all kinds of uh, water and uh, ice events and wind events. And in the background is the Milky Way galaxy, okay? And then in the foreground, if you will, is Jupiter and, and Saturn, I believe, here. Uh, so it's all together and um, um, promoting the idea of it being taught as one integrated subject. Okay, I'm not alone. Uh, the, the national uh, education stand standards in many countries, including the United States, uh, do have earth and space science together as one of the priority sciences. And here you can see uh, the next generation science standards for the United States has physical sciences which involves um, physics and chemistry, life science, which is biology, and then earth and space sciences. And you have the universe, uh, the earth with the solar system, and then a lot of earth science after this, okay? So that's what s at least some countries do. They have it as a high priority together. Uh, state education frameworks, such as the one in Massachusetts where I live, also echo this science curriculum priority. Uh, this is a, a progression from kindergarten through elementary grades, middle grades, and then um, early uh, high school. And you, you see 
what is expected to be understood. Uh, for the kindergarten kids, it's just the patterns of motion of the sun and the moon and the sky. Uh, but then uh, you end up getting more content knowledge as you progress along uh, and more abstraction, such as the solar system is part of the Milky Way, and then um, more abstraction that uh, there is nuclear fusion in the, in the guts of stars, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and you can see that um, this is just a portion of what is expected to be uh, taught and understood, but um, earth and space sciences are taught together. Okay, then there's scientific underpinnings. We're in the middle of a incredible scientific experiment, very important for our uh, survival, and that's basically the warming of Earth's surface as a result of the greenhouse gases that we're adding to the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, here's an animation by NASA, which takes you over a hundred years to show that the warming is significant and uh, troublesome, something to worry about. This is an Earth and space phenomenon. Why? Because it begins with the sun, which irradiates the Earth, which warms the Earth. The Earth re-radiates uh, the energy in the mid-infrared, and that mid-infrared radiation then gets trapped by these trace gases, which are greenhouse gases, um, uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and uh, methane, CH4. And so that warms our planet. That's what's kept our planet from freezing over most of the time during its 4.6 billion life, year old lifetime. But what we've been doing is been adding more greenhouse gases due to our combustion processes. Uh, carbon dioxide in particular um, has a long residence time and we've increased that by more than 44%. This is best understood within the context of Earth as a planet that is being irradiated by a star, the sun. It's an Earth and space science topic and should be taught as part of an Earth and space sciences course or courses. Okay more scientific underpinnings. The greatest story ever told is basically an earth and space science story. Uh, you start with a hot big bang 13.8 um, billion years ago we think and uh, as it ex uh, the universe expands and cools you get particles and from the particles you make galaxies and stars, stars with planetary systems which have chemistry going on in them. They already had chemistry going on in the star forming regions and then um, that chemistry leads to organic chemistry in the case of our earth and then life uh, and uh, then uh, humans to actually ponder all this. This is in many ways an earth and space sciences uh, issue and what better place to teach this great story. Cultural underpinnings. Our national parks are incredibly popular they enthrall people of all ages. During the daytime, they can see magnificent rock formations, which have been subject to all sorts of upheaval and weathering. Um, this is El Capitan in the Yosemite National Park, along with Bridalville Falls. And then at nighttime, there's the Milky Way, because these are protected areas with very little light pollution. And you can um, now have astronomical events, which the National Park folk uh, host and um, it's very popular. Cultural underpinnings. In the cities, we have the planetariums, which was uh, discussed by Rudolfo Lange in the previous talk. Uh, there's lots of planetariums in our cities, uh, and they attract millions of people per planetarium for the big ones yearly to their celestial shows. Uh, this is actually a University of Washington uh, planetarium, which uh, is used mostly for the students, but is also used for public open nights. Okay, so cultural underpinnings. Lastly, there are the icon iconic images that have been taken over the past 75 years or 50 years. Yeah, 50 years. Uh, going back to the Apollo 8 mission, where we saw Earth as a planet from moon lunar orbit, uh, that was uh, transformative for our consciousness. Uh, moving on to the so-called pillars of creation, that's a part of the Eagle Nebula, M16, and um, uh, showing the interplay between uh, hot starlight and resistive uh, pillars of dust and gas inside of which stars are forming. 
And then finally, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, which has, with the exception of this star and this star in our galaxy, all these dots are galaxies. And, and uh, we're seeing galaxies uh, with look back times that take us all the way back to uh, the beginnings of galaxies some 10 to 12 billion years ago. So these iconic images have transformed, transformed our public consciousness. Lastly, there are the museums uh, with their collections of gems, fossils, and meteorites, some of which you can touch. Uh, and then uh, also they have collections of spacecraft like the lunar lander and the uh, space capsules. And um, uh, farther along here, I believe there's a, uh, a Viking lander. Uh, these collections are immensely popular. So tremendous cultural underpinnings for earth and space science education. Relevance to STEAM education. Okay, um, technology and engineering um, is involved in all areas of Earth and space science exploration. Uh, looking a long time ago with the Apollo 16 mission on the moon with a man in a space suit that those human factors had to be figured out to make that man a functioning human on the moon. This is a telescope that was deployed, an ultraviolet telescope, uh, which succeeded in getting our first basically images of the Magellanic Clouds, for example. And then there's the, the rover with its telecommunications. So we have all sorts of in-situ and remote sensing going on, spacefaring with rockets, telecommunications, big data, robotics, and uh, as I said, human factors. The Perseverance rover is a, a great example. Uh, this is on its way to Mars right now, and it's gonna be taking samples uh, that will be picked up by some later mission. And of course, this image is, is an artist's impression. And so there's uh, some example of the arts in STEAM education, okay. Despite all these underpinnings, relatively few opportunities exist to teach high school earth and space sciences. Uh, I went on to the schoolspring.com. It's, it's the United States uh, resource for uh, jobs in secondary school. And I uh, focused on high school where currently there's 115 biology jobs, 92 chemistry jobs, 96 physics jobs. So physical sciences are covered pretty well. But earth and space sciences, it's only around 27 jobs. So clearly the job market does not reflect the public interest or the national and state mandates. Okay, here's some uh, quotes. More than any other secondary school science, earth science is contextually homeless. And at the high school level, only 72% of earth science teachers are certified to teach earth science. That's with a major or a minor. And at the middle school level, where most earth science courses are taught, less than 20% of earth science teachers majored in an earth science area. Most are majors in other sciences, science education or elementary education. But it gets worse. Overall, only 40% of all earth science teachers have ever taken a course in these sciences. So you can just imagine what these teachers are missing and as a result, what the students are missing. Okay, this is an old reference. I would love to get a new reference with new stats on that one, if anybody has it. Okay, so I have a call to action. I would like us to identify and coordinate institutional stakeholders in the earth and space sciences. Okay, and then once identified, uh, work with them. Establish integrated degree programs in the earth and space sciences at our colleges and universities. That's number two. And number three, develop professional certificate uh, courses and workshops in the earth and space sciences. So that's my call to action because something needs to be done to bring up earth and space sciences in the educational realm. The institutional stakeholders, of course, you can uh, imagine a lot of them. Uh, globally, there's the Umbrella Organization, International Council for Science, um, and then down to the International Astronomical Union, which most of you would be uh, most familiar with, okay? Um, and then on the national level, I'm just talking about in the United States, NASA's Science Mission Directorate, although it's less involved in uh, secondary school education and teacher training, um, American Geophysical Union seems to be still active, National Association of Geoscience Teachers, of course, uh, and then the Meteorological Society and the Astronomical Society and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. 
And then finally, the National Science Teachers Association, which has to get on board with all of this sort of stuff. Um, textbooks, there are some textbooks in Earth and Space Sciences, but not many with a search that I, took, I made. Um, integrated science, it's usually in an integrated science textbook. This is my favorite. Uh, and, and like other integrated science textbooks, it not only has earth and space sciences, but also uh, physics, chemistry, and life sciences. Some earth science textbooks have some space science in them, and some astronomy textbooks have earth science in them, uh, earth and moon system. Uh, this textbook, I, I, I particularly like. It's free, and it's, um, I can't, I have to move this thing here. Uh, it's open stacks, folks, and um, mm. uh, I know for a fact that it does have some earth and space science in it, but uh, we need more earth and space science textbooks. So existing degree programs in earth and space sciences, they do exist. Uh, and here's the, the universities that I've identified as having coordinated programs in the earth and space sciences, uh, most of which have educational tracks. And if you're fortunate, uh, you could be at the University of Washington and get to go on a field trip to the Grand Canyon like these lucky folks here. All right. The certification courses and workshops uh, need to be advanced because uh, there's a, a lot of uh, makeup work to be done. Uh, so we need to coordinate our earth and space science organizations like NASA, uh, American Geophysical Union, the International Astronomical Union, and um, I have to get this right, the Network of Astronomy Schools for Education, NASE. Uh, and so uh, the IAU is, is busy, uh, but uh, to get the earth sciences involved, we need to work with folks like the AGU, uh, National Association of Geoscience Teachers and National Science Teaching Association and similar associations in other countries. Okay, so your input, uh, is very important uh, regarding how to best coordinate the earth and space sciences in, an, in the educational arena. Uh, your, your input is very important. Please feel free to contact me at that, this email address. Um, but in the meantime, approach your favorite earth and space science organization uh, with this idea of better coordinating earth and space sciences. Approach your local and state educational institutions. Those would be the high schools. Um, and uh, approach your favorite colleges and universities. And then finally, nurture your earth and space science education communities. And I am delighted to now be a part of the global hands-on universe community with its Galileo teacher training program. And um, at this point, I'll just say thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, there is one question from Tut. Uh, please fill the Q&A uh, to uh, make questions. But now uh, in chat, in Indonesia, there was integration of arts and space science in the school curriculum. But now they are separated and included a little bit in the geography and physics. How do you suggest to the students and the teachers to study arts and space sciences in our situation. So it, it sounds like in Indonesia, uh, they were together, but now they've been separated out. Is that, is that correct? Because I can't see, I'm having trouble getting the Q&A up here. Um, but, and it sounds like astronomy is part of physics. So I would like to speak to that. Um, it makes lots of sense for astronomy to be hooked together with physics if you're going to become an astronomer. Um, because astronomy in many ways is applied physics. However, uh, I think we're missing the boat uh, if we don't recognize that for most people, astronomy is part of an earth and space science umbrella. Thank you. Uh, it's time is over, so thanks to William Zwarta. Thank you. Okay. So and, uh, I I'd like to introduce the next 